Hi folks, this is Jessica Stouth. I'm the VP of Quant Strategy at Quantopium, and I'm going to go ahead and get started with today's webinar. We're going to be talking about uh, Algo Grading 101. I think we've built this as. This is going to be a really informal webinar where uh, what my plan was is to go through um, and show some of the new tools that my research team has been building, specifically showcasing uh, PyFolio, which is a Python analysis module for um, performance and risk analysis of algorithmic trading strategies. And I'm going to walk through a couple of examples of how my team would evaluate strategies that might be shared um, in the forums where people ask us to you know, look at their algorithms and say, hey, does this look like a good investment strategy? Does this look like the type of algorithm that Quantopian is interested in allocating capital to when you launch your fund? So I'm going to show um, examples really focused on using the research platform and using the PyFolio tear sheet. Um, I have a couple of examples lined up that I uh, plan to show and walk through, but this is a pretty easy format to do something interactive. So as an experiment, um, if you're listening and uh, you have a post that you've seen um, in the forums that has a back test, you'd be interested for me to take a look at with a tear sheet. Um, at any point, if you want to drop um, a back test, um, it has to be a shared back test ID. I'll show you um, when I start the demo what that means. But um, if anyone wants to drop, uh, you know, sort of su spring surprise questions on me and, and point to a couple of algorithms that are in the forums right now that you'd like to see tear sheets of and uh, have us talk through, I'd be happy to do that. And I think uh, we should have time to do that. All right. So um, where I wanted to start was to show a really cool new feature of shared back tests in the forum. And I'm going to start with uh, Grant's algorithm that he's shared and um, there's sort of a thread that's been evolving uh, where he's sharing source code from an algorithm um, and asking for feedback in terms of if this looks like something Quantopian would allocate to. Um, so a couple weeks ago he shared a first version of an algorithm. I gave some feedback to it. Um, he's iterated it a few times. So I want to scroll ahead to sort of the most recent version uh, that we've looked at because I think it is a good example for a starting point. So sorry for the um, fast scrolling here. So um, I gave Grant some feedback talking about that we're really looking for hedge strategies that are looking for um, looking to identify alpha in the market and find um, long, short, market neutral strategies that uh, are going to, to generate consistent returns over time. So um, Grant came back with a great improvement to a strategy that had been long only with a static hedge. And he shared an example in the forums where he's got um, now a long short strategy that's basically a mean reversion strategy. Now, um, when you click on source code tab for a shared backtest, you're going to notice that we now show you the backtest ID populated right at the top of the source code page. It used to be that what you would have to do would be to clone an algorithm from the forums, run a backtest, and then get that backtest ID from the URL of it. Uh, the top here, which was a little bit cumbersome. So now what I can do if I want to run a tear sheet analysis on an algorithm that someone shares, I can really just actually copy and paste this backtest ID over into the research environment. So I've got a research notebook open already, um, but I can go back and just sort of show my starting point. Um, so I come into the research platform. I've got a notebook uh, that has two lines of code I had to write in it um, that I've labeled PyFolio tear sheet example. So I open that up and in here, really, I'm just going to do two things. I'm going to hand in a back test ID um, and I've already just now, I think we'll see, run um, this one to load it into uh, memory. And then the only line I need to run right now to get this um, basic PyFolio tear sheet is just um, on the backtest object, I run create full tear sheet. So what I'm going to do is step through the analysis results that I get here, talking a little bit about the, the feedback that I would give on this strategy, and then I'm going to show a couple of other examples. Um, 
one caveat and where I'm going to stop and sort of cover today, I'm only going to be talking about evaluating strategies that only have in-sample data. So what I mean by that, and when you look at this first summary table, you can see that the data set this backtest has been run over is from September 1st of 2005 um, to September 1st of 2015. And today is... Uh, middle of September of 2015, so I'm not looking at data that was run um, since the algorithm has been code uh, code versioned, version controlled, excuse me. So everything is back test. In the future, we'll do another webinar where I talk more about evaluating algorithms that um, have had their code frozen, let's say, three months in the past, and now we're actually watching um, out of sample performance to see if that strategy um, that was locked down, let's say, beginning um, of the year has done well over the course of the year, when you run a tear sheet analysis on an algorithm that has an um, a inception date in the past, you're going to eventually be able to see um, a back test and then an out of sample and then a full history set of data. So for today, I'm just going to talk about evaluating back tests and I'm not going to talk about um, out of sample data. So the first table we've got to work with is really a high-level summary table. It's going to show us how many months this back test has covered and headline statistics like what the average annual returns were, 5% um, a year, great, that's positive, um, annual volatility, 20% a year. So from already from sort of an institutional quant perspective, we're getting to um, a sharp ratio that's about um, 0.27. So you know, the sharp ratio is basically the annual returns adjusted by the annual volatility or the risk adjusted returns. Um, so already an institutional quant type strategy that we'd be looking for, um, we'd probably be saying, mm, we'd like to see volatility that's that's low and on par potentially with the annual returns. And so what that's going to give you is a sharp ratio of about one at the end of the year. So your algorithm is going to um, you know, steadily make a little bit of money each month, um, and it's not going to have really volatile up and down swings. So we've got some more metrics that I won't um, go through um, that deeply. Immediately, kind of what I'll stand out is, okay, maximum drawdown of 52%. So that's a, that's a pretty... Um, sort of a, a pretty big red flag for an institutional manager that might be looking at this strategy because they're going to say, okay, at some point during this strategy's history, it has lost half of its capital. That's going to be a really difficult event to recover from um, over the course of the back test. Um, I can come down and skip down here and look at what the estimated alpha is over the course of the back test. Um, right now for this um, version of the PyFolio tear sheet, we're computing just the single factor alpha where we're using beta or correlation to the market as our only other explanatory variable for returns. Um, and you can see that in, in good news, this strategy has got a low beta, so it's not just following what the market is doing every day. So that's, that's great. It means there's probably been some attempt in constructing the strategy to think about um, hedging and doing something other than uh, making a bet on that the stock market is going to continue to go up. Um, but on the other hand, the alpha or the residual outperformance that's left, that's left over, um, you know, doesn't look huge, but okay, let's, let's kind of get to that and come to that as we go. Um, so the next uh, two tables, summary tables that we're going to be able to look at are, you know, there's a lot in analyzing strategies that I think of as sort of glasses half empty. So really when you look at a strategy, you're actually trying to poke holes in the strategy and find the places where it's doing things that you don't like or you're uncomfortable with. Because only by correcting those and figuring out why they've happened are you going to be able to make it better. So the next thing we look at are basically over the life of the back test that we've run. And here we're looking at a 10-year at a back test. Okay, I'm going to notice that here's that 50% drawdown that I saw in my summary table. I can see um, what was the peak when I went into that drawdown was in March of 2007. Um, and the valley, so the, the lowest point of my drawdown was in um, 2010. And actually, um, because of, when you'll see when I scroll down to the equity curve, this strategy um, did not dig itself back out of that hole again and did not 
surpass its high water mark until March of 2015. So that's that's pretty tough to overcome. Um, oops, sorry. I've also got a summary table that's looking at what the um, returns were over a set of hard-coded stress events that we like to evaluate. Um, so we have, in you know, a um, sort of discretionary way, gone in and established a bunch of different time periods over which we're interested in looking at how algorithms did. For example, during the Lehman collapse, um, when the U.S. and European debt crisis um, happened um, in the quant flash crash in August of 2007, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll show you when we scroll down, there's a bunch of nice little time series plots that show those results. Basically, you're just looking to say, hey, from a stress testing standpoint, you know, transport me to um, April of 2014 and let me see how this strategy would have fared. So that's another uh, glass half, glass half empty <laughs> sort of uh, sort of analysis. The next thing that I look at are a bunch of quick summary tables that are showing me what positions this strategy is taking um, and really looking at what the holdings of a strategy are and what the portfolio weights are is an extremely powerful way to understand what the strategy is doing and what types of risk exposures it's taking on. Right now, our analysis just shows the symbols. I think one really powerful extension um, that we're gonna be working on is doing sector level roll-ups. So depending on when you see the positions, whether they're really recognizable um, symbols or tickers, you learn a lot very quickly. Um, but sometimes they're obscure symbols or tickers and you're wondering, you know, um, hey, what what is this company that's being invested in? You're going and checking on Google Finance to see what that is. Um, where really probably a quick thing you'd like to be able to do is look at what is your exposure to common sectors and then you might be able to understand, okay, this is a strategy that's only playing in uh, you know, the financial sector only playing in energy and utilities, or maybe you can then tell that the algorithm author has actually carefully spread their exposure evenly across all of the nine common sectors you might think about. But for now, we're just going to look at what are the top 10 long positions this algorithm ever takes over time. Um, and now one thing I'm going to notice about this strategy, um, back in the thread that I had talking with Grant, I know that he has been looking at the top 50 stocks um, listed on the NASDAQ at any given time. And so depending on how he's decided to construct his portfolio, I might expect to see that he's invested in all 50 of those stocks at any one time. Um, or I might see that he has higher position concentration. What this is showing me is that at some time, and I'll see more when I get down to a time series plot, um, I'm actually having really high exposure in any one name. So this 0.38 means that at a maximum, I had a 38% allocation or over a third of the capital I deployed was in QQQ. Um, and same thing across these tickers. So what I'm seeing is that the, um, the strategy is going to be able to allocate as much of a third of its portfolio to one single stock which is um, something that you know you wouldn't really classically want to see in an institutional quant strategy. Um, you'd want to see diversifying and sort of maybe capping your exposure to any one stock um, at a level that's that's probably lower than a third of the portfolio. Because right, the problem is your strategy might be designed to exploit something like like you know short or medium or long term mean reversion. But if a third of your portfolio is held in Tesla at some point, and yes, over um, you know, the next day, week, or month, you know, otherwise Tesla might have re mean reverted, but, um, you know, a news item comes out or um, Elon Musk is, you know, caught doing something he shouldn't be doing, um, you know, Tesla could experience a news event um, that might move its stock price in a way that's, you know, completely orthogonal to what your model would have expected. So now, you know, you're, you're, third of your portfolio is in that stock that maybe has really big news risk, um, that probably doesn't fit within kind of the risk management framework that, that we'd be looking for. Um, so same idea when I go down here, I can look at the top 10 short positions that have been taken. Um, so it looks like this is a reasonably symmetrical strategy. So whatever process it's using to decide to allocate on the long side, um, it's used, coming up with about the same maximum concentrations on the short side. Um, and these are the same names I'm seeing that are the top exposures that we ever have. Um, then I have a nice little summary table that's showing me what are all the positions that I've ever held and what are those um, 
concentration. So I can see that, okay, there's times, and actually let's look at the very end here. So um, PBCT, that's a symbol or a position that I only held uh, with ever a maximum weight um, of 0.7%. So I have a really wide range when algorithms or when, excuse me, when um, stocks are put into my portfolio with this algorithm, I can see that whatever process is being used to determine the weights could vary from putting a very small amount of weight on a single company to putting up to, you know, 38% in one single company. So that's interesting. That's not, again, other than sort of seeing these, these top end weights being higher than I might like, um, that's not otherwise necessarily a good or bad thing. Having a um, diversity of weights that might be allocated to any one name is, is interesting, and then I'd want to understand kind of why. All right, so now we get to the time series plot that's where people tend to obsess a lot when they post uh, back tests into the forums. Um, and so here I'm looking, again, we set at this 10-year back test um, that I ran on the algorithm that Grant shared. So you can scroll right to this and say, okay, well, look, this version of the strategy um, doesn't make money, so it's not interesting. But you can see that by going through those summary tables of information um, that came before this equity curve, we've learned a lot about the strategy and we've learned that maybe it's doing something pretty interesting. So while this equity curve doesn't look great, um, we get the sense that it's doing something intelligent that we might want to drill into and understand more about because if we could um, correct the things that are um, that are making it you know lose money especially you know the the time here that this strategy initially is really suffers its first big drawdown um, is you know the um, 2008 2009 financial collapse so this is you know sort of um, something that you could understand um, you know actually here it's following the market down and then really what you have is a failure to be able to to turn around and have a recovery um, and so your lack of correlation with the market over this time period unfortunately means you know that you follow the market down um, but then you're flat and you only really have this nice consistent recovery over the last two year period um, one thing that I look for when I look at an equity curve like this, that's a nice long back test, um, which is you know sort of always the first step that we do to evaluate any algorithm. We take that algorithm and we run it through a test harness over the longest possible data set that we can get data for. And the reason that we're doing that is to see, you know, here's this algorithm, here's this robot that's accepting information in, making decisions about the world and communicating those via buy and sell decisions. What we'd like to do is collect as much data as we can. How did this robot react when, um, you know, uh, 2007, August of 2007, how did it react during the financial crisis? How did it react during lots of different market cycles? And if an algorithm can weather lots of different conditions and stress periods in the past, that's helpful information for giving you confidence that it's going to be able to weather um, unforeseen circumstances in the market, you know, that are going to happen in the future. And really, the other thing you might look at is um, to say, okay, this looks great right here, right? If I sort of um, highlight the last two-year period for this algorithm, um, it's looking like, you know, kind of a nice straight up and to the right slope line. And, you know, what do I know about these last two years? Well, by reading the thread of the conversation, what I what I think I know is that this is the time period that Grant, who wrote the algorithm, was really focusing on, right? So um, he's, I think, and, and I'm certainly, you know, kind of playing the role of like advising or, or reviewing the strategy from like a little bit of a black box standpoint and I'm allowing in sort of some context contextual information that I have um, but you know not kind of kind of taking it to the standpoint of like doing a full, full review with the algorithm author which you know would be would be the next step and part of what we would do when we find an algorithm that looks interesting so I'm sort of attributing to him um, some stuff that he may not have done but this looks to me like um, I had an algorithm author that's really focused on the past two years of what the market has done um, and um, tweaked and adjusted their strategy so that it looks good. That's a perfectly rational thing to do. And the research process involves, um, you know, looking at a strategy, seeing where and why it's losing money and trying to correct that and turn it into something that makes money. So you have this interesting push-pull with developing quantitative investment strategies where, yes, your whole point is to be iteratively building something that looks better and better and better, but not at the cost of focusing solely on a certain 
um, hand-selected subset of data that is not necessarily the same information your algorithm is going to encounter when you set it free out into the wild in the future. So if I had to extrapolate forward what this algorithm was going to do, um, if I could only know about the historical backtest data, let's say up through um, or, or back to the you know first quarter of 2014, I would draw a nice straight line up into the right like this, and I'm going to expect to be making um, you know. 20, 30 percent a year, whatever this um, this annualizes out to over the recent past. Whereas, you know, once I pull the curtain back and look at how this strategy did further in the past, now I'd have a lot more uncertainty about, hey, what's the next market regime going to look like? Is it going to put this algorithm into a sideways period where it's neither making nor losing very much money? Is it going to suffer another serious drawdown that I won't be able to recover from? Um, or is it going to um, you know, have uh, have some volatility and, and move upwards again. All right. Uh, so the next plot looks at the rolling portfolio beta to the S and P 500. And we have spent a lot of time talking about this. After we launched the paper trading competition, the Quantopian Open, the thing that we realized um, was really that we were bringing, you know, sort of democratizing access to this quant finance technique. So we were bringing in a lot of folks who had a ton of great um, computer science expertise, coding ability, um, ability to, to research questions and come up with interesting ideas. They didn't have the sort of background and exposure to the um, financial marketplace to sort of have this this idea that hey if I come up with something that makes money but is highly correlated to the broad market index the S&P 500 for example then you know that we represent or terminology wise use is saying it has a high beta um, that's not something um, that's that interesting to institutional investors who might um, come and, and put capital into Quantopium's crowdsourced fund. What they're looking for is strategies that have a low beta or low correlation to the market. And the reason for that really is just when you think about it, they're looking um, to invest in something and pay performance capital for something that they can't get elsewhere. And it's very easy and cheap and efficient in our current markets to buy exposure to the S&P 500. So uh, we had seen a lot of strategies that when we looked at this, um, and this is, I think, um, you know, they're, they're overlaid because they're so tight, but we've got on this plot a rolling six and 12 month so looking at trailing six or 12 month correlation to the S&P 500, we were seeing a lot of strategies that had consistently, um, you know, a, a beta correlation to the market of one or even two. A beta of two, in, um, from an issue intuition standpoint, you can think of as when the market goes up by 5%, your strategy is going to go up by 10%. But conversely, if the market suffers a 5% drawdown, your strategy is going to suffer a 5% drawdown. So you're kind of following the zigs and zags of the market, but in a more volatile way. So here we get to, I think, one of the highlights of this strategy is that it is hedged, right? So it has done something. Um, we know that it's using long short techniques to make um, its rolling correlation to the market very, very low. So that's great. It means that we're doing something more interesting than just investing in the broad market index. Same concept when we're going to look at this next plot, which is a rolling six month sharp ratio. So now we're just rolling forward and saying, if we only had the past six months of data, what's our risk adjusted returns um, look like? And we've got a running long term average with this blue dotted line. And then you can see how the rolling sharp ratio sort of wanders above and below the historical mean. So for this strategy, what I'd be looking and saying is, OK, you know, the historical mean is not so great, um, but really the thing that that I don't like is that we're wandering kind of below this mean, you know, just as often if not more than we're wandering above this mean. Um, and so the consistency of how, you know, sort of predictable it's going to be from what my last six months sharp ratio is to my next six months sharp ratio, that's not looking like it's, um, you know, super consistent and compelling. That ties back, you know, certainly with going back up to this equity curve, you can see that we have regimes where we've got good risk adjusted returns or at least decent regimes where we have strongly negative risk adjusted returns and regimes where we've got pretty flat risk adjusted returns. And so that, you know, ties together with looking at um, this rolling six month sharp kind of wandering all over the place. All right. So the next plot that we look at, I would say this is 
um, a very rough cut at looking at exposures to common um, quant sort of risk factors. So um, I will not have time to do full justice to talking about the fam FEMA French um, risk factors, but I'm going to give a really high level overview. Um, Basically, we're looking at three common risk factors, and we're actually looking at the returns to portfolios constructed um, on the assumption that SMB is small caps, um, small minus big. So uh, this blue factor here is going to say, um, if your strategy is highly correlated with this blue line, if you're seeing this blue line you know, go high above zero, that means that you have are probably having some preference where you're long um, stocks that are on average of smaller market cap than you are short. And that's basically a bet that says, over the time range that I hold these stocks, I bet that, among other things, these small caps are going to outperform these large caps. Uh, the second one in orange is I'm looking at high growth minus low growth companies. So if at any given time I hold more high growth than low growth companies in my portfolio or I'm long more high growth and short um, more low growth, you're going to see that represented as, a, um, as this orange line coming up above zero and then momentum. So I'm going to look at uh, the trailing momentum. Am I investing long in stocks that have been going up in recent history um, and short in stocks that have been going down or the reverse? So actually what we'd like to see in this plot um, and for a strategy that we think has a lot of alpha, you'd like to see very low single factor beta exposures um, to these. So you'd like to see this line hugging right around zero. Um, and the fact that we see this line wandering all over the place um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a deal breaker, but it does tell us that the person who designed the strategy wasn't thinking about controlling for these factors. So there's nothing in the algorithm that's saying, hey, make sure that I'm you know, long and short roughly the same size of companies. And if you don't control for that, what's going to happen is that over time, you're going to take on unintended exposures to things like market cap risk, growth risk, or price momentum risk. All right, so that's sort of the, um, the extent that I'm going to talk about that. Uh, we then next have two more sort of glasses, half empty plots. We're looking at what were the top five drawdown periods, and those are highlighted um, in this plot. So right, you know, we have this uh, this downdraft with the financial crisis that we, you know, really as a whole we can't dig ourselves back out of. And we can see that again in this underwater plot. I think we've you know, probably uh, probably covered that pretty extensively. Um, this next row of plots I really like, which is giving you a sense of consistency of the returns the strategy is generating over calendar periods. So this heat map on the left is showing me across all years and months that I ran this strategy, what were my returns and what's a heat map of that. And here's just going to give you another dimension to quickly be able to scan your eye and say, okay, great, you know, um, annually, on an annualized basis, 2014 and 2015 were, you know, pretty much the most solid years for this strategy, and, you know, it gets, um, you know, really suffers in 2008 and isn't able to recover from that. Um, and I'm also able to look at the distribution of monthly returns, and you'd like to see that distribution have, you know, a positive skew to it where you're more likely um, to have a positive month than a negative month. Um, I'm going to skip through um, some of the rest of these a little more quickly, but I had mentioned that we've outlined these sort of um, hand-picked crisis periods where we're going to look at how the algorithm, which is the green line, does with respect to the SPY, and we're just looking to sort of see how does it react during these different crisis periods. For this strategy, um, you know, some of them look fine, look pretty flat. Um, I think when we get down to... Um, well, which is sort of the fall, yeah, so um, August of 07, um, you know, we have trouble. This strategy actually looks like it uh, drops at sort of a slightly different time than we think of the SPY dropping, um, so it suffers its worst drawdown in a period I don't think we really capture um, in these plots here. Uh, so next, uh, something that I look a lot at is this gross leverage over time. So one thing, um, uh, and I guess, let me hopefully 
it's possible to see uh, both this gross leverage and this long short cash exposure plot together um, for you guys in the webinar. But um, one thing that we're looking at when we look at your gross leverage um, and then your uh, long versus short exposure is really to see if there is intention and in risk management. So if this is wandering all over the place um, or if it looks capped, if it looks like there's some target that's being tracked over time, um, then that's something that, that we're looking for that can, um, you know, even if a strategy doesn't necessarily um, perform that well, a strategy that when you look at the leverage over time and the exposures over time, appears to be managed mm -hmm. is going to look a lot better than one that wanders all over the place. All right, so um, then another really powerful visualization um, that you know probably organizationally should be right next to those um, summaries that I showed you of you know what the holdings were. Here's a time series plot looking at my portfolio allocation over time for the top 10 holdings. So this takes us back to saying, okay, over time, hey, look, I'm taking these transient, very large positions in stocks that are either going to be long 30% or short 30%. Um, these are the top 10 holdings I ever have. So the different colors are showing me there's times when um, I'm long and short, um, whatever this is in blue, which I guess is probably QQQ, which is the hedge, um, versus other individual positions like forced solar or Tesla or Amazon. Um, so a good thing about this is that um, it does look like it's capped. Being capped at 0.3, um, you know, it, I think it's like a little bit too high, um, and that's sort of something that, that I would um, follow up on and talk about, but at least it does look like it's being managed, um, which is cool. And then number of holdings per day uh, looks extremely consistent, so that's great, right, because it says the algorithm is probably doing something to define this is how many holdings I'm going to take and then uh, structurally it's indeed taking that number of holdings um, and it's not wandering all over the place. This is a spot where with some strategies you'll be able to see something like uh, there was a fixed set of stocks that were picked um, you know here in 2014 and some of those stocks didn't exist in the past so you'll see this sort of decay looking back um, at older data where the strategy just um, has basically you know you can think of it as a survivorship bias but you know stocks that um, just didn't exist in the past makes it hard to run a long back test. All right, so um, I've been pretty exhaustive in running through this algorithm, um, and hopefully that's that's helpful and, and sort of gives the overview of how we think about things. I did want to um, show a, at least one other example. Um, so I'm going to comment out uh, this back test run, and I'm going to look at um, another strategy that was shared in the forums. Um, so again, just to load a back test result, I just grab this source ID um, from over here. I think this is the um, algorithm that I'm going to look at next. So this one was um, a trading strategy, which is looking at uh, reweighting the components of an ETF and using an ETF as a hedge. Um, and Pavi, who actually won um, the most recent Quantopian Open Competition shared this in the forums, um, and I thought this was a really nice um, example and a really nice um, thread where uh, Tom Austin has replied with a lot of very sound, um, good quantitative finance insights here. Um, sort of while saying, I have no coding skills, um, he then go ahead, goes ahead and gives a lot of really great insight um, that I think are, is going to help Pavi make the strategy better. But I also think it looks pretty cool on its own, so I wanted to use it as an example. Um, so again, if I find this in the forums, I can just grab this back test ID. If I'm happy with um, the settings and the time range that he ran his strategy over, and then all I have to do is go drop that into the um, into the research platform, into this notebook to um, populate his back test. Um, so I did that, and you could see there's like a nice little progress bar that ticks up um, while I'm loading the back test. Then I go ahead and say, um, create this tear sheet for me. So I'm not going to go through in the same level of um, detail that I did with grants, but let's go ahead and look through um, the same type of metrics and see, you know, where things look um, better or worse or different. So right away, you know, headlines, hey, great, uh, my annual return is higher than my annual volatility. So that means I've got a sharp ratio of above one for the backtest period. I like that. That meets sort of that first criteria. 
Um, and now also I'm going to say I'm giving Pavi like a much more of a free pass here because I didn't go pull a 10-year back test. And this may well not look as good over a longer time range. Um, but I wanted to just take a look at the two years of data that he shared. Um, and then follow-up exercise for you would be to go ahead, clone his algorithm, run it over the longest time period you can get it to work for, run this tear sheet again, and then you'll be able to get a lot more rigorous analysis of what he's done here. So the next thing I like is the maximum drawdown I've suffered in this period is 6%. That's great. That means I'm not destroying so much of my capital that I have a, a low chance of fighting my way back. So I can see, again, when was that 6% drawdown um, and dig into that if I want to. Now I can see the holdings that my algorithm has. So he's described in his post that he's picked 10 uh, stocks that are part of um, the XLE ETF at uh, I guess currently, so um, sort of looking at um, what the as was constituents of the ETF is probably going to be a good extension of this strategy if we start wanting to run longer back tests. So I can look across and say, great, looks like I've got pretty consistent uh, maximum weights to each of these names. It never goes above 15% concentration in any one name. That makes me feel a little bit more comfortable than you know twice that having an exposure of 30% of my portfolio in any one name. Um, still, if you showed this strategy to an institutional quant, they would say, you know, 10 longs and one short, that's crazy times. That's um, way too high of position concentration still. But when the short is an ETF um, and it should have, you know, high liquidity and good capacity, this is certainly something that I think um, is a great starting point and worth looking at. Um, and actually, when uh, when I look down here, um, you know, again, giving him a little bit of a free pass looking at just recent data, um, but this looks great, right? His equity curve is up and to the right, um, and it pays no mind um, to uh, the stock market um, suffering a pretty substantial drawdown. So now I get to my rolling portfolio beta. Great, this doesn't raise any alarms. I have a low beta strategy. Um, that makes sense to me given the economic rationale that he's explained. My rolling six months sharp, you know, if you think back to the um, algo that we just looked at and how far we were deviating above and below our historical average sharp, this is looking a lot more consistent. Um, you know, it does have a period where it's below its historical um, mean for a bit. Um, but but it's looking you know pretty good um, down here. Actually, you'd probably say, okay, I would want to think about and understand um, these factor exposures. They're certainly not zero, so the strategy is taking on some um, exposure to these size, growth, and momentum risk factors. Um, but I look at the drawdown periods, um, and they're not too severe, and they're spaced out apart from each other. The worst drawdowns that I ever suffer in the range of six to seven percent. So one of the things that I could be thinking is, okay, I can definitely tolerate a six percent drawdown. So if this strategy is one that I might want to apply leverage to to improve and make the returns look more impressive, that's not going to suddenly cause me to um, to be really worried about a, a huge drawdown. Um, now looking down at the calendar returns, really the headline is just nothing scary still. So across um, the years and months, I don't have a real standout of a time period where the strategy suffers greatly. And what you're looking for, right, is just year over year, you, you want to see that it's profitable across lots of market cycles and lots of different years. Um, we can look across, uh, since this is a short back test, we've only got two different stress test periods that fall within our um, our test, but those look reasonable. Now here um, would sort of be where you'd start to get to some of the weaknesses, I think, of this strategy. Um, and so first of all, um, the returns that I'm looking at, I'm now being reminded are when I'm running this strategy at a leverage of you know almost two and a half. So really, if we saw that we said we had a, a you know uh, returns of forget what it said at the top. 12 or 16 percent a year, well, we're applying two and a half times leverage to get that. So you actually kind of have to discount that back by that factor to put everything on an apples to apples basis and think about your unlevered returns. Um, and then the other thing is that the uh, leverage is is kind of consistently drifting here from three down to two. So that tells me that there's something about the way that the strategy is allocating capital that's not uh, sort of perfectly memoryless or perfectly rebalancing on a monthly basis. So that's going to be a, you know, sort of a note I take down and go back um, and look at and think about and maybe talk to the algorithm author about. 
Same thing on the long, short, and cash exposures. There's some sort of drift going on over time where I can kind of tell that everything is sort of kosher in this most recent couple of months um, from when the strategy was written. But the longer I look back in time, the more things drift out of whack. And um, you know, there's there's some ideas about why that probably is, which is uh, you know that um, I think what he's doing here is using a static universe selection, right, um, as opposed to dynamically choosing the stock. So problem with a static universe selection is it's a, a little bit of a form of look ahead bias or survivorship bias. If you say, I'm going to pick a set of stocks that satisfy a certain criteria today, then I'm going to back test that strategy starting 10 years ago. That's injecting information that I did not have 10 years ago, that A, those companies would be around um, solvent and part of XLE in 2015. So um, one of the things that a, a bunch of folks who've been working on this type of strategy where what they're looking at is um, trying to either reweight um, components of an ETF or do some sort of um, mean reversion or structural ARB type of opportunity with components of an ETF versus the ETF, they have very reasonably asked us to help them find data sources that have historical um, constituents of these ETFs. Because that's what you'd want to see, right, is not just picking the set of um, 10 stocks that are in the ETF today that make sense to trade, but actually creating a dynamic filter that would let you run a back test back um, you know, as long as that ETF existed and know, hey, what were the largest 10 stocks by market cap in that ETF, um, you know, every quarter since its inception. Uh, that's something that would improve this a lot, I think. Uh, so again, we can look at the portfolio allocation over time. Um, and we're seeing that, you know, we're, um, we're basically putting, taking on and off exposures of about 15% in each one of these positions um, at a, you know, at some frequency over time. We have just a static um, hedged position in the underlying ETF. Um, one thing that I like about seeing uh, this type of plot is that I can see that this strategy is making lots of independent bets. Um, and there's actually a whole uh, second module of the Pifolio tear sheet, which is just focused on transactions analysis. Uh, that we'll be trying to add to a to a second release uh, sometime in the next couple of months, where we actually get really explicit about being able to look at how many independent bets the strategy is taking, how many are being accumulated over what time range. Um, and I'm not sure if my audio is having having problems. Um, I'm just going to note that my audio might be having problems. So uh, let me just check. So I'm going to hope that you guys can still hear me. Everything that I can check from my side looks like um, looks like I'm still broadcasting audio, so I'm going to go ahead and keep talking. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and keep talking and assume you guys can hear me. Um, all right, so, uh, okay, so where I left off was talking about... Um, that this portfolio allocation over time lets me get a little bit of insight into the number and frequency of independent bets that the strategy is making. Um, and why that's interesting, right, is as I'm starting to think about, okay, if this back test looks compelling, now what I need is to accumulate out of sample data that says, um, you know, this strategy continues to work when it sees new data that it didn't already know about. Um, I'm not going to dive too much into the multiple different ways you can think about testing for overfitting and hold out samples of data and inverses out of sample, but I'm going to take a very simple approach in sort of thinking about the only truly out of sample data um, that we have available to us is tomorrow's, right? So um, a strategy that's making a lot of independent bets per day or week or month, um, as I go out of sample, I'm going to be able to collect out of sample data and new independent bets at a high rate, right? So maybe there are going to be um, 10 decisions made a day or a week. Um, now I'm going to accumulate a good number of independent decisions that I can evaluate relatively quickly, which would be in contrast with something like an asset allocation strategy that might be looking for very slow moving signals and might be changing its allocations to, let's say, you know, domestic versus foreign investments over the course of um, several quarters or a year, that could be a great relevant 
alpha, you know, producing strategy, um, but it was going to take a lot longer for, you know, me as an, an external uh, researcher or evaluator to be able to separate out whether that strategy has done well because um, of chance or because of persistent skill um, or predictive value that's going to hold up in the future. All right, so let's take a look at the last couple of plots, um, and we're just basically looking at um, how often the strategy turns over and what the distribution of the daily trading volume is. So with that, I have uh, taken a lot longer to dig through these plots um, than I thought, so I'm going to go ahead and pause there, and those were actually the two examples um, that I was sort of most interested in showing. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pause there and mute myself just for a second while I figure out how to... Um, go open up the questions section of the webinar, um, but I'd like to see if anybody has questions either um, about the analysis or feel free to also um, toss me any questions just about um, the, the um, crowdsourced fund strategy um, or anything that you, that you might be interested in. Okay, I think I can see the list of questions. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through as many questions um, as I can can get to before um, the one o'clock hour. And so if I don't get to your question and answer it, um, when we post the recording and the follow-up from this webinar, I'll make sure that we write up answers to all of these questions because um, there are great, are great questions in here. Okay, so the first question I have is, hey, that you said this looks good. Where do I clone this algorithm from? So where I copied um, the algorithm from was just from the forums. Um, and so if you go to the forums, um, and I think this is still probably near the top of the list, but let's take a look. Um, yep, there it is. So uh, trading strategy, reweight the components of an ETF. Um, the other cool thing is um, you might have noticed that we've added these search tags um, and one of the search tags that has been applied to this strategy is that it's a market neutral strategy. That's a great search tab because it's going to show you um, all strategies that fall into this category that I'm talking about where you're long and short and looking to exploit um, some edge between them. So if you click on market neutral, then you'll see actually the first two entries um, right now are both of the algorithms or, or at least our threads that have in them the two algorithms that I reviewed today. Um, and then uh, to clone it, you're going to just go uh, to, the, to the page for the trading strategy and click this big red clone algorithm button. And that's going to give you uh, a copy of that code, and you can run your own back tests on it. Um, you can do what I just did and throw it into uh, a notebook um, and run that tear sheet code on it. 
uh, and you can tweak it and start to improve it and make it your own. Um, so the next question are, what are the fund's preferences for gross leverage and net exposure? Um, is it okay to have a leverage of two if the net exposure is zero, one X long and short? Great question. So the way we're thinking about evaluating strategies for the fund, we're sort of thinking like how we'll be able to sell this fund to investors, right? Um, and the way that we'll do it is to really think of each algorithm as a building block. So to evaluate a whole um, bunch of algorithms that are eventually going to get all thrown into the same you know, meta optimization and be run, we're really gonna try to think of them on an apples to apples basis. So we're gonna evaluate every algorithm on effectively an unlevered basis. And where we'd apply leverage would be at the portfolio levels of algorithms above that. So what you wanna do when you're looking at um, thinking about building an algorithm that you think we might wanna allocate to is really try to decouple your use of leverage from looking for alpha. Now, I know that's a little bit of a constraint and there are certainly strategies out there that can sort of use um, systematic application of leverage differing over time as like part of their alpha strategy. But for us, that's just a level of complexity that, you know, I don't think we're going to be be there yet. So I would more encourage you to look at um, looking at, uh, do I have something that has, you know, uh, is market neutral and looks compelling on an unlevered basis. Now, we're going to evaluate it unlevered, so then we have realistic expectations for what the sharp ratios and returns of an unlevered systematic quant strategy are going to look like. So we're not going to be, you know, setting these really high bars of expecting, you know, 30% returns a year from an unlevered strategy. We're going to be looking for things that have consistent positive returns, you know, even if they're small. So hopefully that answered that. Um, Wondering how would the long backtest period and evaluation, okay, affect algorithms that use fetch CSV or other external data sources? Um, for example, the ones in the Quantopian store. Actually, those will be two really different things. So um, right now, for we allow you to pull in outside data using this fetcher method. Um, and that's not going to be something I think that we're going to be able to use for algorithms that we put into the fund. Um, so we, we want to uh, go ahead and allow people to pull in their own data, and we think that the use case for that is going to be we don't want to bottleneck people evaluating new data sets that we haven't gotten integrated into our product yet, um, and we also don't want to bottleneck people from doing things like um, you know, having some offline from Quantopian process that determines their portfolio and using Quantopian only to place trades for their own brokerage account. And so Fetcher, Unbottlenecks, really those two use cases. But I think it's just going to be too challenging for us to say that we're going to be able to audit strategies that are pulling in outside data using Fetcher. Um, and so I think we've updated the contest rules such that you're not going to be able to um, submit or win with algorithms that use Fetcher going forward. That creates a little bit of a, of a tension, but hopefully we're going to very quickly be able to come along with um, adding uh, data, external data sources to the Quantopian store in a way that will um, bridge that gap. So let's say you write an algorithm that uses external data um, that you've you've pulled in via Quantopian in this um, in this data store. So that's fine, right? We database that data. We have access to it. We can audit it. Um, we know how much history there is. So if you're using a data source that's only recently been available, then yeah, you're only going to be able to backtest that algorithm. You know, let's say you write an algorithm on estimized data. You're only going to be able to backtest it a couple of years. I think still it would be interesting to then like look at the underlying strategy and say, hey, is there some way to get some other data source to get get one longer back test to try to um, think about how this would have done more in the past. And that's just like a, a challenge innate in exploiting new data sources that might have alpha. That's something that is definitely not a deal breaker. It's still interesting to us. Um, Okay. Um, okay, great. Um, so what next question is that I've been talking a lot about market neutral and stat R, but what about trend following or momentum systems that can have shifts in beta exposure? Like, aren't those valid too? Um, and blending those with market neutral could have additive value. That's a great point. And I think actually gets to um, really just basically the um, sort of ordering of strategically how we're going to be rolling out allocation. So um, because we have to, you know, kind of actually, the way we're, we're going forward with allocating to, to strategies for the fund is going to be an incremental process, just like how um, we've run Quantopian as a startup so far. So we're going to start with one, two, three, four, five. And as you basically think of it as putting on um, 
an individual trading strategy, as you're legging into your position, you really can't afford to add early um, a strategy that's going to make you overall uh, very much unhedged or exposed. So that's kind of why we're starting with a preference of adding um, individual building block strategies at first that already kind of are functional hedged units themselves. Now, once we make it up to a critical mass of having, um, you know, a, um, a fund that's running that has, um, you know, let's say 10 strategies in it, and we can say, okay, great, now we can add you know five new five or ten new strategies at the same time that might have different exposures that we wouldn't want to um, put on in uh, by themselves but we're going to add a whole you know set of new algorithms and together you know they all make one hedged basket great that's something we can do down the line basically it's just not the um, the way we're going to be able to to go from kind of zero to one and, and one to five so really it's just a, a matter of um, ordering how we layer on these strategies um, uh, someone said, "Is are we going to record this? I think we're going to record it and you're going to be able to watch it later. Um, so let, uh, okay, let me just see if there's other, so another question, um, can you set up the research environment with tools to let me compare different systems that have full back tests? Um, I, so not in a like side by side way, like where they're merged into the same tear sheet right now. I, that's going to be awesome and we'll definitely build that. Right now, you can um, pull in as many individual backtest IDs as you want and then run like reports serially, but there's not a way to like merge that all together into a nice like comparison. And similarly, we don't yet have like a nice pre baked way for you to do something like you know what I call like a poor man's optimization where maybe you're going to run a parameter optimization across like, you know, six or nine different settings, get like, and then pull out like the sharp ratio and make a heat map of that. I think we might have some notebook examples where you can kind of brute force that, but it's not like baked into this um, Pyfolio tear sheet analysis yet. Um, that's probably coming like not too distant future. We are working on like a portfolio level version of Pyfolio that lets you say, hey, I'm allocating X percent to these five different algorithms, and then it will return to you all five individual tear sheets and then the portfolio level tear sheet. So um, we're working in that direction, but uh, we don't have like a, a nice pre-baked sort of side-by-side -side comparison. Um, do we always, always discourage using leverage? So, um, you know, not certainly for you to trade in your in your own account, uh, but rather, I hope I explained this clearly, that um, leverage is fine. We're just trying to remove leverage from the equation when we're evaluating algorithms. So put everybody on an apples to apples basis. Um, and what that means is like, for now, uh, we're probably not going to be preferring strategies that are like using um, sort of timing when they apply leverage off and on. Exception to that would be something like, you know, hey, here's what my strategy does. I'm capping it at a leverage of one, but it, at times, the model that I'm running tells me that I would rather be sitting in cash than in a position. That's a little bit of a different um, kettle of fish, and I think of that as sort of capital utilization um, when you're talking about like the zero to one leverage, and that's something that's much more of a um, gray area that I think we're, um, we're willing to um, look at. So I want to apologize because I, I actually sort of said that I would like on the fly load um, tear sheets and look at them. And I think someone did share one that they want me to look at. Um, but I'm going to have to um, wrap up the webinar in the interest of time and ending on time. But what I will promise to do is go back and continue to work on that thread from Grant's post that I showed um, and uh, follow up and run another tear sheet and post comments back to that. So with that, again, if I didn't get to your question, um, I will write up answers and share them along with the recording after the fact. Um, and I wanted to thank everybody for taking the time to hop on and join me remotely. Um, and we're going to definitely do more of these sessions. Um, and I'd like to actually you know, follow through on that promise and try to make um, the upcoming ones both more interactive and then also start to talk more about how you compare in and out of sample data. So thanks very much for joining.